it was like this all encompassing moment of my life and everything happening in this one moment in releasing my need of control over and surrendering, like what that meant. Surrendering didn't make me weak. And that was my thinking, right? Was that, you know, I am not weak. I was the youngest at this and I was this, and I, right? It was like all yeah. the things that I quote pushed through. And when it was this moment of surrender, what I got was that surrendering is not a giving up. It's trusting in. And it was as if God just lifted my feet and care and the pain didn't leave. I call it my Paul moment. We said, remove this thorn from my side yet. No, <laughs> you don't keep the pain to remind you, but you're going to float through it. You're going to float through this pain, but you got to surrender. You got to breathe into it. Hey everyone. Let's start healing. I'm Adrian Murchison and welcome to episode 101 of the Let's Start Healing podcast. We have more in common than we think and what we have in common can change the world. So happy to be here with you for this episode. I hope you were able to check out episode 100, which was very special. I was able to reflect on many previous episodes with fellow podcaster and my nephew, John Russell Murchison, and it was a lot of fun. If you're new to Let's Start Healing, that episode would really orient you to the many different types of episodes that we have around spirituality and delve into social issues sometimes, into culture, but it is always, always with a foundation of spirituality and love. So today is no different because I have with me a very special guest, a longtime friend, Jazz Jones, who is actually returning to Let's Start Healing because, wow, she's been on this podcast at least four times, maybe five in one way or another. Jazz is a force. And you will see that or hear that when you meet her in just a couple of minutes. She is a resident now of Austin, Texas. I met her here in Atlanta many years ago. She actually just moved to Austin in the last, I don't know, uh, five months. She and her husband. And we miss her here in Atlanta. I met Jazz uh, years ago at a spiritual discussion group, uh, Course in Miracles discussion group, and we became fast friends and sisters in life. We have so much in common. One is we have a common love of God, a love of spirituality. We both have a spiritual relationship with our late mothers. We just, oh, how can I forget? <laughs> We have a love of running. And in fact, Jazz and I, we competed in back-to-back -back triathlons uh, in California. And we definitely want to do that again. So we have so many things in common. And yet we are so different in many ways. Or we come at things from different perspectives. But we always end up in this common place. And so it was just a really great conversation talking to her. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a self-empowerment, energy empowerment, life coach. And she founded an organization that she has with her daughter called Mad Miracles. And that's Mother and Daughter Miracles. And so they hold classes, forums, conferences, different events around uh, self-love, self-care, self-empowerment. Uh, she's going to talk about today an event that she had over the last six weeks leading up to Easter. And that was a love the you in the mirror challenge. And that was a virtual event where she would meet with participants every week and they would have uh, homework and conversations around self-care and self-love. And although it has ended that six week period, she will mention in this conversation how there'll be an extension to that Love the You in the Mirror challenge. So there is more to come around that, that if you're interested, and I know you will be, you can take advantage of. 
She's an author of several books. One is a book that she wrote about her journey in her relationship with her late mom. It's titled In My Mother's Voice. She has been a contributing author in several books of Kate Butler's Inspired Impact series. She's a photographer and she has a photography book that she published. She is a Reiki master and a practitioner of several different modalities around energy healing. There's just so much about jazz. I am so excited for you to meet her. We talk about so many things in this conversation. Healing, of course, spirituality. We talk about healing from trauma. Many things that we talk about in this conversation relate to what we deal with in everyday life and how to cope and walk through some difficult experiences in love and uh, in God if we choose to. So let's get to it. Let's meet her and let's start healing. Welcome, Jazz. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Always good to be with you, girlfriend. Always good. Gosh, you know, I had said that Laneda and my nephew, who you talked to, Russell, were like the top people in terms of frequency on my podcast. But shoot, I think, you know, this might be three or four. This definitely more than three times. Definitely. definitely this might be the fourth definitely time. Definitely three for sure. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I think, that, matter of fact, this is our fourth. Yeah, at least. I do. Yes. Yep. Yes. So well, thank it's you. Good to be back. Yes. <laughs> And, so, and kudos, you are, are rocking and rolling and healing the world with your connections. And so, so thank you for your serving the world with your light. Well, thank you so much. I try. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you got it. I try, I try. And you are here for a visit from Austin. You left us and you moved to Austin, Texas, although you travel the globe. Can't pin you down. Wow. But except for, you know, we got you for 48 hours. Yes. <laughs> yes. 48 52. And actually, you know, you have me for eternity. I just happen to be <laughs> in the physical space for 48 hours. <laughs> yes. And so, Jazz, this is a girlfriend's weekend. Why was this so important this weekend? Mm, well, this is uh, the precursor to my birthday, which is coming up. And then our other sister friend that we were with, it was her birthday last week. And March is Women's Month. So I could name all of those as as reasons, but ultimately it was and is really about staying soul sister connected. But I'm in the midst of within Women's Month, I always bring back around the love the you in the mirror pledge. And, you know, one of the chapters in my book is that you can't pour anything from an empty cup. I came here this weekend to fill my cup, like truly. And there's nothing better than sistership. Yeah. To refuel. Yeah. So that's why I'm here. You're (laughs) filling me up. Yes. You're filling us up too. And, you know, we've been talking about friendship in different conversations. And what's really occurred to me personally is with my good friends, I feel like we accept each other and I feel accepted. Mm -hmm. I feel accepted for me. And I can tell not only in my mind and my thinking, but just the way I express myself. I may just say something off the cuff, some stream of consciousness thing or something, and it's just an acceptance. And when I think about some of our common friends, this tribe that we have, I feel that we're all different, although Mm -hmm. we have a huge bond around some things in common, but I think we're all different and we really accept each other for who we are. Absolutely. And that's so important with women. Absolutely. And, you know, this was part of our conversation. Yeah. But when I think of little girls growing up and, you know, I'm going to talk about, you know, growing up in the 60s. And there's some dynamics that have changed in that. But I think there is still a thread of girls are taught and really geared towards competing against one another. You know, we go out for the pageants. It's more of this one-on-one. It's a competition. Even within our friendships, talk about, well, she's my best friend. No, she's my best friend. Yeah. You know, we can all just be friends and be aligned. But in this evolution, it's really about the sisterhood, this sistership. And 
I think that's so important in terms of passing on to younger girls and, and young women that intrinsic bond that blows wind on our wings and keeps us rooted right in our truth like wherever we are like you said it's like loving each other where we are in our differences you know i'm going to let the men speak for the men but in observation you know men have this this bonding you know yeah. whether it's around sports the the male bond is very different even in their competitiveness they can compete against one another mm-hmm. and be boys right right you know what i mean and and they can talk to each other a certain way. Yes, yeah. mm-hmm. yes. And there's not that competition of one friend over the other. That's what I mean. You, you know, how many guys do you hear talking about, well, he's my bestie. He can't be your bestie. You know, they're not competing for yeah. best friends, right? And and so uh, the evolution for me has been, the transcending from really friendship to sistership. And I think what we have is, you know, what I call the mother sistership. (laughs) Take some folks back, the mothership connection, that it's a mother sistership connection. Uh, This aspect of nurturing one another while as sisters being able to be straight up with one another. Yeah, because I mentioned, you know, I had a previous podcast with some girlfriends that are your girlfriends, and somebody had commented to me, one of my other friends, she says, you all are some strong women. (laughs) And I thought, yeah, isn't everyone a strong woman? Aren't we all strong women? No. I don't know if I know any weak women. Uh, In the words of of Whitney, I didn't know my own strength. Mm -hmm. And... I think that is part of the importance of sistership is when I am not at my strongest, when I am feeling weak. Oh, that's that, true. We have weak we moments. Stre- yeah. For sure. The strengthening of the and, sistership. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and if we get to black women, mm-hmm. that's a whole bigger conversation. Yeah. And I th- but, yeah. also think there's a different, a, a distinction between what we label identify as a strong woman exactly and and a woman of strength you know uh black women we've been labeled you know got to be strong got to hold it down and this thing of bearing bearing the weight and you can is, take is what it I call it you know yeah and but I don't want to take it and I don't have to take it and I don't believe that we we have to do that we can be women of strength Without being the punching bag, without having to carry the weight of the world. Right. Right. And uh, I believe for, for me and our sisterships, our strength is being able to reveal our vulnerabilities. It's getting beyond that label of, but I got to be strong. That carrying that label, I believe, weakens us individually because of that thing of, you know, I got to do this. I got to carry this. No. I wonder if down. it's that we don't feel I know that we can feel I have to be strong for our family but I wonder if we sometimes feel like we have to carry the weight of the world and maybe we don't have to maybe it's a right a, you know it's a demand right. yeah, that we put that's on what ourselves I'm yeah you know the 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 societal norms yeah uh and You know, everything that we have bought into or, you know, may buy into uh, that labels us, defines us as carrying the load, carrying the weight. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, even even if you go back to the uh, let's go back to the old black cinema that, you know, it was the mammy, the black auntie that, you know, carrying the weight. You know what I always think about? I mean, we... You know, I had a strong mother, you had a strong mother, and my mom was the most delicate yet strong woman I ever knew, you Mm -hmm. know, and we have strong women, aunts and all of that. But you know who I go to in my thoughts when I think about what we're talking about is Gladys Knight. I heard her tell a story on behind the music maybe 15 years ago or something like that and she was telling a story about just the weight of being the leader of the group 
obviously. And I believe she talked about, she talked about so much, but I believe she talked about how she had a miscarriage and had to perform that night. Yes. And just her whole description of miscarrying and the whole experience and just the expectation. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow. Now get up and get back that to was, work. That was such a example to me of the weight, right. the weight of the world. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, we get to choose, you know, but often we we take on the weight. I say we take on the weight the load, Mm -hmm. right? We'll take on this external load and forget to bear our own weight, right? And what I mean by that is, is bearing our own truth and not taking on other people's loads. And I won't even restrict that by color. It is very systemic within the black community, just, you know, single parenting and just the whole dynamic. That's what you said, you know, when we, we go back and look at the dynamic and part of what I think, because I know this is what we're going to get into in terms of, you know, from a spirit standpoint, that there's this conditioning as mother nature, right? She's mother nature who nurtures all. And in that, it is being mindful that we cannot nurture others without nurturing ourselves. And we have really gotten it out of context. We got it backwards. We take care of everybody else. And that is where I think that thing of being strong comes from. When I say taking on the load, the bearing of of, of the burden is, you know, taking care of our families, taking care of our jobs, taking care of our community, that we are the caretakers. And I find that there is more awareness now of the importance of self-care because you cannot care for others without self-care. Right. It's it's impossible. Mm -hmm. You may task for others, but you cannot care for others if you're not caring for yourself. You can't pour out what you don't have within. Right. And I think women have to be careful of being taken advantage of for what their gifts are because I have a girlfriend who made me aware I'm a nurturer, I'm empathetic. And really it was just a conversation. It wasn't anything big, but I was talking to her about a situation and she said, you know, that's why that person turned to you so they could get that. And so I think that we have to be careful or mindful about that kind of thing because people will take advantage of things like that, of different natural, our natural way of being. There's always takers. There are always givers. Yeah. And no one can take from you what you're not willing to give. That's the absolute truth. And, and so I go back to the importance of, of self-care and, and being true to self. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the distinction between nurturing others, just because you task for someone, doesn't mean that you're caring for them. Doesn't mean that you're nurturing. And when we are or clear, their burden is your burden, right? And when we take on that that other burden, that is not uh, again. It's not a nurturing situation. That's a codependent situation, right? Right. And we have to get clear in our in our own self care and nurturing. Are we being codependent, not right. taking care of ourselves? Because first of all. Are you taking the time to understand what you really need? Right. And ask for what you need. And you know what? That word, I like to use the word enabling because I think codependent is a confusing word. And wouldn't you say that codependent is the same thing? If I take instead of the word codependent, be careful that you're not enabling that person or yourself or enabling that situation oh, in a exactly healthy what way. You're saying. Yeah. I use the term codependent very specifically because with respect to enabling that some are dependent upon being used. That's that's mm, become that's their, where they find their value. Right. Oh, yeah, that's true. And so I'm that's depending true. upon you. Yeah. 
because wow. if you're not taking from me, I don't know what to do with myself. Mm-hmm. That is a codependent relationship. Yeah. And that yeah. is what serves an enabler. Mm-hmm. Right. It's the expression, catch a sucker, bump his head. Right. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, how does an abuser abuse? They attract someone mm-hmm. willing to be abused. Mm-hmm. And let me speak out to women. I'm not saying, oh, you know, I want this person to come and abuse me, but energetically, and we've got to own our own energy in terms of how we occupy the space. We talk about occupying space, right? How we operate and occupy the space in this world. And we attract not what we want, but we attract what we energetically project and send out. Right. Absolutely. Why is it in a room full of people? Right. You have a thousand people in the room. And I, and I promise you that the abuser will find the one willing to be abused. Mm-hmm. They'll connect. Mm-hmm. Right. Just like, ooh, you know, they say opposites attract. And well, why do birds of a feather flock together? You know, we can look at all these right. euphemisms and understand that it is about attraction. That's why we are the sum total of the five people we surround ourselves with, mm-hmm. right? Who are we attracting in our life? Because it's, it's a reflection of what we think. Right. Everything that we generate in our existence is the reflection of our thoughts. And then we create stories around those thoughts. And the more we speak that story into existence, the more we attract the validators for that story. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. You yeah. Know, I'm like, what are we attracting? Yeah. And then I, yeah. I want to say, look, with an abuser... If you're in a room, say you attract that abuser, you attract that that man over to you, and then he may ask a question that helps him to go deeper. You know, he gets the response that he wants mm-hmm. or he's looking for that lets him know, okay, you know, there's an opportunity here, and then keeps going and going and going. So it's not, we're not saying anything about trying to put any uh, blame on the victim or anything like that. Well, I denounce both of those terms, blame and victim, and focus on accountability. Yes. Right? You know, in this cancel culture, if you will, we're so quick to blame and understanding that everyone is operating from where they are, right? And it's not until we take responsibility. Yeah. For this space that we Mm -hmm. occupy Mm -hmm. and if we're not loving the people around us, right? You know, if you can't change the people around you, change the people around you, <laughs> right? So it's I not about that. changing that. somebody, but, cha- you know, I how, love it. And, and the only way to change your environment, to change the external, is to make the change on that internal energy that we're projecting. That's why practicing self-love, self-appreciation, you know, it's been looked at as being conceited, uh, you know, we talk about, oh, self-love. But in actuality, it's the commandment. I think it's so interesting how the ego poses it behind humility when we say, you know, oh, I'm an empath and I just give to others and I just pour myself out to others. But you're not honoring yourself. So really and truly, you're not honoring others because to love thy neighbor as thyself What's the standard as thyself? Right. Right. But if we're constantly looking externally to set the standard, right, then what we have done is lowered our own bar and we teach people how to treat us. So one of my favorite shows I, I have to plug is, is Sisters. And, you know, there's uh, Fatima. Uh-huh. And so he and his wife, real life wife, and I believe it's Kadeen. I'm, I'm going to find it because I, I don't want to mess up their name. But they have a this book out, We Over Me. They talk about how they set the time. Yes, it's Devel Ellis and Kadeen Ellis. I just, I, oh, I love yeah, them. Oh, yeah, Their relationship comes first. Yeah. Not the children. Because see, if their relationship is jacked up, guess what's going to happen? And, and so often in relationships, when we sacrifice self, For the sake of others, that's what sets up resentment. That's what sets up disparity and And breakdown. And dysfunction. All of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's the same thing when we sacrifice, like we over me. Yeah. I also say that 
we have to be conscious of the me and make sure that me is in alignment. Yes. And filling me's cup up. Right. So that I can operate in the we. Yeah. I think about, I was sharing this with you last night. I'm not trying to beat myself up or anything uh, by any means, but I think about just relationships I was in like 20 years ago. And I've always been strong in my spirit. I think my relationship with God has been evolved. I mean, I'm just trying to get to the things that I put up with, with men in my relationships. And well, the thing is, is though I had low self-esteem. I had an awareness that I had low self-esteem, but still, I'm still just kind of fascinated (laughs) with the things that I put up with that I just um, subjected myself to just pain and stuff and Definitely talk about accountability. I mean, I've took accountability for that stuff a long time ago. I guess where I am now, I just can't even imagine. I cannot imagine just the emotional things that I went through. And I mean, you know, I just was hurt by somebody less than six months ago. So it's not about not getting hurt again, but it's about what I subjected myself to, an imbalance in a relationship. But I did not, I didn't make the investment. I I shouldn't say that because I've made a big investment in my self-esteem, but it's been like such a journey. It's been a real, real journey. And the greatest investment that we make is the investment in self. Right. Right. Because that's what we give from, giving from the self. So you got to invest in self Mm -hmm. and making sure that we don't judge our chapter 20 in chapter 40. Yeah. In chapter 50. Yeah. Right? And it's more like I'm looking at it like in a, an observation and fascination. Mm-hmm. Go on. <laughs> well, you know, I always say that we all came in on a different boat, but we're all in the same ship in this relationship. And I believe that we're on the planet to navigate relationship and navigating relationship. A part of that dynamic, the, the full expression of that dynamic is the relationship with self. Mm-hmm. Right. And 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 so I go back to we uh, we attract the projection of what we are and what we've come here to learn. We call those people unto us, whatever relationships yes. we we call yes, those we to us. So I would say, speaking for myself, I have not had a bad relationship in my entire life because I summoned each of those relationships to become the woman that I am. Yeah. Right. So whatever the breakdown, whatever the issues, those were my less life lessons that I called to learn to operate me mm-hmm. in my A own part truth. of your growth and evolution. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. So how would you describe you when you are feeling vulnerable and you are talking to God and reaching out to God and you're in a really vulnerable space, what are you like? What do you think about when I bring that up? Well, first, I, uh, I operate a space, from a space of always being vulnerable to God. You know, it, well, I mean, I don't mean to God. I mean, when you are feeling vulnerable mm-hmm. as your human self and as jazz, you're in a vulnerable space. I know you have a strong, beautiful, close relationship with God. I'm trying to get to you, jazz, like what is that like when you're in that vulnerable space and you're talking to God? I would have to ask you what you mean by being vulnerable because when I say I'm always vulnerable, you know, for me being feeling vulnerable and being in a vulnerable space is uh being open. Mm-hmm. Well, so like, for example, um, this was so interesting to me. So there's a step over here by the door, you know, and I sit on the step when I'm taking Shiloh out, you know, I put on the shoes that I put on when I take him out, I put his leash and collar on. And one day I was just so happy. This was like maybe happy. I wasn't happy. This was like a couple of months ago. And I sit down and I didn't even know 
I mean, like I knew I had agita, but when I sat down on the step, I just started crying. Mm -hmm. It was like about seven in the morning or something like that. I just started crying because I was so unhappy because I'm getting ready to Mm. start my day. I'm doing, you know, something I don't want to do at that time. Mm -hmm. And so I just started talking to God in that moment. Now, I have a morning practice to start my day, but I was in a very fragile place within myself, you know. Okay. And so now, then it, I look at those two words differently, being fragile and being vulnerable. Well, whatever. I'm just okay, trying to get I to a point. To I'm just trying to yeah. get to a point yeah. of you just like inside you. The reason I brought it up about that experience was because I sat down on that step. I sit down on that step mm-hmm. a few times a day. And I sat down there a couple days ago and I realized I felt like happy in my spirit because I've been really focused on uh, what I want to do with God in terms of I want to be open and allow God to Mm -hmm. just do, you know, Mm -hmm. and I've been feeling real, just like joyful in my spirit. So it was so funny. I was just like, that's just so funny because I was crying over here every, you know, Mm -hmm. so that's all I'm just trying to get to is like those moments of when you are, I say vulnerable, just feeling fragile. What is that like? Because I know that you're connected to God. So you're like that. And then you're communicating with God, I'm thinking. And so I'm just trying to get to an experience. In essence, to me, when I think of, of communicating with God, it prayer is speaking to God and meditation is listening to God. And I will say when, when I go to God in communication, in my sorrowful or or heavy moments, quite frankly, are the same as when I go in joyful moments. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is that it is, it again is taking time to be wholly present. I mean, whole and present, right? Um, so as you just expressed, you're sitting on the step talking to God when you're crying. And ooh, and in the next breath, another day, you're sitting on that same step feeling cold. Those to me are one in the same, mm-hmm. right? It is taking that moment to be present. And I've been sharing with you about the Love the You in the Mirror pledge and, and part of the process. And one of the pledges which we did the second week, today I love myself by living in the now not in the past. And there's a distinction of now and the present moment because the present moment is an experience in time. Whereas I, I experience now as all encompassing. Now is a reflection of my past. It's a thinking of the future and it's in the present moment. It's now it's right now. And My desire is, you know, as as we talk about communicating with God, is that wherever I am, God is. Wherever God is, I am. Yes. In the now. Yes. And that is really more of me practicing the surrender to the now. Yes. Like, you know, God, right now I'm lost and I'm calling on you, you know, oh, God, right now, I am so grateful for sitting here with my sister and and thank you for that, that it is, it's the acknowledgement. And so how I would sum that up is, for me, that is walking in gratitude with God. Yeah. That no matter, it's, it's not about the emotion, it's about the now. It's about, I'm scared, I'm lost, I'm crying. Oh, I'm grateful, I'm happy, all of that. I am here now. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really so important. I'm here now, period. Period. I'm here now, whether I'm happy, whether I'm sad, whether I'm bored, you know, whatever, I'm here now. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, as I told you, I, you know, locked my keys out. I locked my my keys. I locked myself out of the house. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the garage. And it happened because I wasn't being present. And I will lose my keys when I am not present. Mm -hmm. It's not the first time. Really? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So I'm sitting there in the car. Somebody was helping me and they had to go back to their shop to get a tool. And 
I'm sitting there in my car and I'm just like, I was thanking God all day about different things. And I was like, it happened because I wasn't being present. And I really don't want to be present right now in this moment. Like, I just want this to be over. I want this moment to be over. You ever have bad things happen and you just like want to be distracted because you want that thing to be over. But then I said, let it, let it it's a pass over. Right. Let it pass over. Right. And so I said, but I know that's not the way to do this. And I let myself be present and thank God and pray and all of that kind of thing. But it's, it's in all kinds of times to your point yeah. to have that connection because circumstances are circumstances. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's how we respond to it. And I go back to the energy of what, hmm, you know, my favorite question, what's the thing for? I drew this in. But you asked me about a moment. So I want to identify a moment because this came to me as, as we were speaking. When you mentioned about vulnerability and in this, this moment with God, it was, for me, the coming to terms with and the understanding of surrender. This is going to tie it all together. This is the full circle here, okay? (laughs) I am strong. I am in control. I am independent woman, right? And I will acknowledge it. You know, I when I first got married, I was 20 years old and, you know, thought, just thought I was a woman of world-wise and all that. Anyway, fast forward. We divorced and parented and worked our way through friendship, all of this. And he was much older and there was a thing he used to say that would just it was like nails on the chalkboard if this relationship is going to work you need to like what I needed to surrender give up right so in my mind this thing of surrender was giving in (laughs) right that was you know that was my my misguided approach that was my understanding of how I operated And coming to a place, and this is the relationship with God, right, of what surrender really means. Because when you say, when I'm vulnerable, right, I say, wow, when I am in any state, being able to surrender. So for me, it was this distinction between faith and trust. And the moment was when I got into running and before my first marathon, This was my first 18 mile run at mile 15. I caught a pain in my side. And during my runs, this was my engagement with God, my conversations with God. And I'm also writing my first book at the time, right? So it's these conversations with my mother, with God. And, and when I hit 15 miles, I was like, I got this. You can do it. You can do it. Just <laughs> press on, press on, press on, right? You know, <laughs> I'm being the sergeant coach. Girl, keep those feet going. And in a breath, when I took this deep breath and I felt the pain and I, and, and having just said to myself, you can do this. And it was like God's echo coming back, not without surrender. Mm. Not without surrender. You, if you want to press through, you got to surrender. And it hit me like this <laughs> bolt of lightning. I wish like, everybody could have seen your expression. Oh just my now. God. Yes, I'm glad you can't see me right now because I felt, I, I felt the hit right. I was, it was like this all encompassing moment of my life and everything happening in this one moment in releasing my need of control over and surrendering like what that meant surrendering didn't make me weak and that was my thinking right was that you know I am not weak I was the youngest at this and I was this and right it was like all the things that I quote pushed through and when it was this moment of surrender what I got was that surrendering is not a giving up it's trusting in and It was as if God just lifted my feet and care and the pain didn't leave. I call it my Paul moment. We said, remove this thorn from my side yet. No, (laughs) you don't keep the pain to remind you, but you're going to float through it. You're going to float through this pain, but you got to surrender. You got to breathe into it. Let it happen. And so that's why I call it the distinction between faith and trust. Faith, substance of things hoped for, evidence of not things not seen, that 
there's this place in faith that something will change, something's coming, something's going to be different, and we have the faith that it will. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That something is going to be different than what it looks like. I have faith in that. Yeah. Trust, no matter what it looks like, it's just right. Yeah. It's just right for what I need right here, right now. And surrendering to God became my gift of transformation. That became my gift of self-love is to just surrender and really, really basking in and knowing God is on my side. You can't, God, you know, I right. came so you could have life more abundantly. We, you know, we look at this other side of punishment, and, but that God is on my side. Yes. All I need do is surrender to it. So whatever is coming let it happen. at me. Let right? it happen. Yeah. And, and not even just let it happen, but learn from what's happening. Mm-hmm. Right. That the surrender, you know, like you were talking about the openness, you, you know, one of my my favorite quotes of, of Wayne Dyer that I choose to live by. And that is being open to everything and attached to nothing. Staying open. Uh, but don't get attached. Don't get attached to the outcome. Don't yeah. get attached to the expectation. But surrendering, that's what surrender is to me, is yeah. to be open to everything and attached to nothing. Yes. 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 That was, that's my wow. moment. Wow. That's my moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So talk about the Love You in the Mirror pledge challenge and Mad Miracles. We've talked about Mad Miracles before, but yes. tie that into Mad Miracles. And then on the other side of that, I want to ask you a question. And then mm-hmm. I'm looking at, obviously, the pledge. The pledge. So, yes. Yeah. Well, the Love the You in the Mirror pledge was born out of my first book in my mother's voice. And it was from a chapter of, of that name, Love the You in the Mirror. And I believe we've even, you know, what matter of fact, our first podcast, we, we talked about Love the You in the Mirror. And that was an experience I had with my mother uh, when my mother was dealing with depression and in it was a practice that she started getting up in the morning. Good morning, beautiful. I love you. <laughs> Which when I was 14, I thought was really conceited. I was like, ooh, <laughs> why are you doing that? And what I learned from that, my mother had me do it, strip down, get naked, look in the mirror. And that was vulnerability to me. It so was. I'm going to go back it, to that, 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 that word, vulnerable. right? That yeah. was the first, but to stand naked before myself and see myself. Because my mother said, she said, I'm going to leave you here. I'll be back. You tell me what you see. And I remember this feeling of the best word to describe it was yucky. (laughs) I don't want to just stand here looking at myself. And there was this part of me that realized how much I judged myself against whatever standards. You know, I, you know, my boobs should be smaller. My hair should be straighter. My, I went through this list of physical inadequacies, what I think should change. And when my mom came back in and asked me the question, well, what did you see? And I said, this was awful and I, everything that was wrong. And she said, I didn't ask you what you look like. I asked you what you saw. And when I launched my book and I, I went on tour, I, it was called Conversations in Love. And numerous I can't even count the numbers of of women all ages all races all religions that would come up tears in their eyes and the most memorable was a 78 year old woman who came up to me at the end of the presentation and tears in her eyes and she said can I hug you (laughs) and she said thank you Thank you for that permission. She said, no one in my entire life has ever given me permission to love me first. And this, at the time, this was a highly political figure, pillar in a community. And she talked about exactly what we've been talking about, about I've been serving all these people all these years, all my time. And to stop in that moment, because I gave everybody a mirror to look at themselves. And tears just started coming down her face. And she said, oh, my God, I have never taken the time to tell me I love me. Mm -hmm. And I ask every human being out there, how often do you take the time to stop and 
acknowledge love. And Love the You in the Mirror pledge came forth because one of the things that I talk about and I express in the book is, you know, we talk about looking for love and losing love and finding love and all the right places, right. all the wrong places, right? As this this thing out there that we've got to go get, make, have, when the truth is we are it. We are love. And to show ourselves love is to commit acts of love, to generate a feeling. It's not the feeling of love, but it is what am I doing to generate a feeling? What are the acts? So the ple- the love that you in the mirror pledge are what I call the 12 acts of love. Is that what's on and this card? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's and and what we're doing on uh, the Love the You in the Mirror challenge is, you know, every week and this comes back around. I launched it during Mo- Women's Month, uh, but we come back around and we have this conversation of. And the first one is today I love myself by awakening with gratitude and thankfulness, and that goes back to our conversation about what do I do in this this present moment, like right here, right now, and. This was actually formulated along with uh, Girl Scouts of America. We launched it at uh, a state conference and put together this pledge. And and every year I come around and I do uh, a workshop and throughout the year, a workshop, a challenge. And right now we're doing the Love the You in the Mirror Challenge. Mm -hmm. And it's to enroll all individuals to take the time to love self so that you can love your neighbor better. Yeah. You know, we talk about what's wrong with the country. What's wrong with countries, we're not loving ourselves enough. Right. Right? Because if we loved ourselves to the degree that we want whatever transformation we're asking for, if we loved ourselves like that, we wouldn't commit the crimes, the ills. Exactly. Against others. Right. Because of how we're loving ourselves. Right. So right. this is, yeah. Right. Yeah, and that's not, a, that, that. that's a multi-dimensional thing. Yes. Loving yourself is forgiving yourself, accepting yourself. It's, yes. Yes. There yes. we go. Right there. Number three. Yes. Today I love myself by forgiving myself yes. and others. Yes. It's all is expression yes. of that. That's yes. great. Other ones on here. Embracing myself just as I am respecting myself, releasing all judgment of myself and others, listening to understand. That's a huge, all of them are huge. Accepting help from others. That's really big. So I want to pause on that one right there because this ties back to that strong woman conversation we were having, right? One of the challenges is women, because of this veneer of, you know, what I said earlier about my moment of being in control and I got this and I can make this happen and I'm going to do this for everybody else's that carrying the weight of not asking for help. Yeah. And that's what I love about our sistership. And to me that vulnerability is there is nothing that makes us more vulnerable than asking for help. Yes. Yes. Help me please. And you know what? I definitely ask people for help. And yet, Mm -hmm. I mean, often, if I look at now, years past, it is super hard. Yeah. It is so hard. And I mean, you would think that after doing that a lot, that it wouldn't be so hard. It is really hard. Why do you think it's so hard? I think it's hard because of the amount of self-judgment that we have of we're supposed to have it figured out. We are supposed to be able to make it happen. And asking, asking for help is our ego, the she goes way yeah. of saying, oh, well, then you're just weak and incapable. Right. But think about children. And, you know, this is a thing as we grow into our knowingness, yeah. you know, that we're supposed to have it all figured out. Right. Children What's their favorite question? Why? I love a two-year-old. Why? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, why, why that happen? And everything is why. Questions about everything in existence. That's the way of learning and growing. But then we get to this place where we think we should know it. And so to ask for help means that I'm letting you in to what I don't know. And that- But it's not always about that. 
I mean, when you say that, I'm and when I say no, I don't. I don't mean just information. I'm talking about our level of capability. We judge our capacity, if you will, against our capabilities. If my capacity is, I mean, look, you know, we've got these this cup here sitting next to us in a bottle. This is a ten ounce cup. It does not have the capacity to hold this fifty ounce bottle, right? And in order for me to get everything that's in this bottle, I have to expand my capacity. Right. That's asking for help. Right. Right. I don't have the capacity right now to take this on. I need help. Right. And that's what we do is we're judging our capacity. We're judging where we are. Exactly. We judge As where we to are. Our container. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Wow, that's yeah. deep. That was deep. That was that's good. what we do. That's what we do. We 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 go deep. We go deep, right? Yes. Um, giving my very best. Mm. Can my best be today? My best may be less than what it was to, yesterday. Today, my best is I was able to get out of bed. Thank right. you. Mm-hmm. Giving my be- very best is a part of, you know, one of the transformative books for me was Four Agreements. That was uh, what I called my survival book for a while. And that's one of the four agreements is to give your best. But what does the best mean? And that goes back to living in the now. See, each one of these pledges, one links to another, right? Mm -hmm. The only time that you can give your best is now. You can't give your best tomorrow. Right. You can't give your best yesterday. (laughs) You have to give your best to the now. Right. And what does that mean now? And that's the releasing judgment of myself and others. We were talking about this thing of comparison, right? And that's where I talk about the best because we judge within comparison capacity for what the best is. You know, I'm living in Austin now and there's a trail that I run. That is a trail that I used to run when I was training. When I was talking about running 15 and 18 miles. So it's the same trail. Girl. (laughs) Yeah, I go over there and I was like, okay, let me just get this little five mile lap in. And I look over the horizon up the hill that I used to run down and come to the trail that (laughs) I just drove to to run around. Uh Right. But I'm giving my best now. Right. And oh, my she goes, she has chimed in my head. Girl, you know, you used to just, yeah, that would, that, yes, I did used to do that. But right now I'm enjoying this lake right here, right now. And these three miles, or even if I'm walking, so giving my best is being in the now. It right. is being in the moment. Right, yes. right, right. Yes. I don't see it on here, but speak to patience and how important it is for us to be patient with ourselves. I don't value patience. I value grace. Okay. Yes. I think. Patience is another trip up of the ego. I got to be patient. Why? I love the word grace, but what do you think patient means? I got to just wait. Patience is patience is taking the time to wait and allow things to happen. You know, it, yeah, it's an act of waiting. If I were going to sum it up, patience well, is an act of like I was waiting. Under, I was on a treadmill today mm-hmm. and beginning of the year, I, you know, I felt like I was coming back to getting back to me. And then, you know, I, took this month off and then I'm on the treadmill and I'm just like, God, I was kind of feeling like what you were just describing. Am I Mm -hmm. ever going to get back? It just felt like a grind. And I just thought, just stay with it. Mm -hmm. Just stay with it. And to me, that was patience. You know, Mm -hmm. when I was finished, you know, I love the word grace. Mm -hmm. I love that word. And that's true. You know, that applies. So what you just described, stay with it, mm -hmm. is tenacity. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yes. But that was a, I mean, I guess because I have a problem with Mm -hmm. impatience. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, just about that. The energy of words, the power of, and it it is important in terms of surmising and what does it mean to me. Mm -hmm. Words carry energy, right? And thus the pledge, like these words that's why you don't see patient on there, mm-hmm. right? Because patience can be very subjective and judgmental of the self, right? Whereas when I give myself grace, it opens that space up for allowance. You know, I'm just giving myself some grace here and giving thanks for what I'm capable of doing now 
And it's the distinction that I gave you earlier between faith and trust. Being careful not to wait on the will come. I'm just going to have faith that it's going to change. Ooh, I am trusting right now that this pain in my side, it's serving a purpose. Mm-hmm. That's the shift in the energy. And, you know, that's the work that I do is from a coaching standpoint is being present to what's the energy because that's yeah. what we speak into existence yeah. is yeah. energy yeah. so i'm quick to you yeah. know you know me yeah. I'm, I'm quick to cut a person <laughs> with, with a word you know cut yeah, you off yeah, and yeah, say, well, yeah. wait a minute what does that mean to you because there's an energy that that mm-hmm. carries you know what when you just touched your side and what we're talking about i just thought about this um girlfriend of mine and as i mentioned she is I mentioned to you offline that, you know, she's going to be having some surgery. Yes. And she said something that I thought was so deep because she lost her mom two years ago. And her mom, she had been taking care of her for 30 years. Okay. And then her mom passed. And, you know, that's a sacrifice. You're taking care of your mom in the way that she was. And so her mom passed and it was a beautiful home going and everything. And then it's my friend's time. You know, she's a single mom. Also, her daughter is thriving and everything. And then she discovers that she has an illness. And when we were talking, and she said that this, what she's going through, And this surgery is a part of her healing. Mm -hmm. And she didn't mean healing from this illness. Right. She meant overall healing. And I thought that was so deep. And I thought that also that that applied to even before this illness showed itself. Mm -hmm. God was taking care of her healing. And they discovered this illness very early. And even before then, God was taking care of her healing. Right. I just thought that was just so wise. Yes. I mean, you get what I'm saying? I don't know if I'm explaining it well enough. Yes. Yeah. Because we came to heal. Yeah. And so again, kind of going back and, and piggybacking on some of the things that we said earlier about what we attract in our life, the relationships that we attract in our, our life, therefore our healing. Yeah. Right. Whatever our healing journey is. Yeah. You know, it's that line in A Course in Miracles that say healing is when two souls recognize their oneness. Yeah. And become glad. Right. right? That in essence, we're all on the same journey. Right. Right. And it's a journey of love. Right. And sometimes because the route looks different, we think, well, you should be on this path. And well, no, that's not what my healing is calling for. Right. Well, why don't you do this over here? Because my... My healing has called me over here. Right. right. We all have a different journey. Exactly. That's been a huge lesson. Different journey, for same me. destination. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. So your work with Mad Miracles is very much on uh, self-empowerment and focused on women in a big way. What would you say that God would have you do in your work for you? And others, what would he have you do for you in this work? Well, again, borrowing the line of, from a chorus is that which we teach teaches us. And I believe that my job is to love every day, to do those things that I am called to love and to release those that I'm not. That's what I'm called for. Is to say to, that again? That I am called to, to be the love And to do those things that I love every day and release that which is not of love. You know, know, well, that's how we came together, of course, in miracles. You know, to me, it's all summed up is that love is not something that can be taught. But what I'm here to do is to release the blocks to love's presence. And within yourself. Yes. These blocks right here in front of me. Right. Whatever they are. Right. Whatever. And the and. Every block that I am to release, I believe that we're here to release, is the blocks of our thoughts. We think those things into existence. And Mad Miracles, the mantra of Mad Miracles, uh, our philosophy, our feelings matter, our thinking makes the difference. It is to acknowledge feeling, to embrace it, to be present to it. That's what I, I was 
mentioning when I talked about that thorn. Feel it. Feel the pain. Be aware of its present. Don't pretend like it's not there. Don't negate it. Know its presence and press through, right? Feel it, but think a higher reaching thought that keeps me pointed in the direction of my intention, the direction of my desire, Yeah, right? And I believe that the gift God placed in me is the gift of forgiveness and inspiration. I mean, as a child, you know, like, hmm. What's the gift? And, you know, when we just said a minute ago, we all have different journeys, but same destination. I'm a believer that, first of all, we're made of love. Yeah. And the job, the work of every spiritual being is to have the human experience of living love. And so how do we play that out in our experience? And that we're given gifts. We're given the gifts of love that are our operational tools. And so for me, forgiveness, you know, it was a gift that God put in me that allowed me to navigate through. um, And you have to read the book in my mother's voice to really get what I'm talking about in terms of relationship with my mom, the relationship with my dad, the family dynamic, right? Forgiveness is when I say it's an easy thing for me, doesn't mean that I, you know, I, I don't have feelings, but there is not a living being, an entity on the planet that I have such a grudge for. There is not a single instant in my life that I can say, oh, I can't let that go. I can't, you know, (laughs) you know, from my babysitter's boyfriend that raped me to my stepfather who molested, whatever the experience that in the words of Maya Angelou, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey. So those two instances that you just described, was that a process in terms of forgiveness? It was an instance. It was an, it was an instance. It was a holy instance. It was a holy instance. And the first one, and that's what I mean when I say it was a God calling and it was preparing me for how God would have me serve. Yeah. Right. How do I serve others? And in that first experience, my babysitter's boyfriend, when I was six years old, molested me. It was during the summer and I, he came into the room. I, I had a case of a strep throat. And so the other kids were outside playing and my babysitter went to the store and I was in the house alone. The kids were outside and she walked to the store. Walking back. Well, when she walked out the front door, her 66 year old drunk boyfriend walked in the back door and came into the room where I where How old were you? Was. I was six. I was six years old and I was asleep when he came in. I did, you know, I heard the door, but you know, and, and so I was like groggy in and out. And I awakened to him with his head between my legs. And when I went to raise up, he put his hand around my throat. And it was a holy instant. There was this moment that, you know, it's like, and not a comparison, but an understanding when Jesus was on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was having that kind of moment of, now I'm six years old. I remember the thought in my head of he thinks this is my body. There was a holy instant of knowing that I am not my body. That was God. That wasn't a six-year-old right. egoic, right? right? But right. that was a moment that happened in my life that followed me forward to that holy instant. And there, there were these instances in my life that was the first yeah, memorable yeah. one, right? That it was the whisper of God saying, Psst, that's forgiveness right there. Don't you feel free? Mm-hmm. Ooh. And it wasn't excusing what he did, but Father, forgive him for it. They know not what they do, okay? Let me move on with my life, right? And so fast forward to mad miracles, mother and daughter miracles, which is what that was. It was my need of forgiveness from my own daughter. It was the breakdown of our relationship and the healing and the coming back together in that, right? Uh, Thus the madness, you know, our miracles are born from our, our madness. And it goes back to the giving and receiving. Yeah, you have the ability to forgive, but can you receive forgiveness? And that's why I can say, you receive forgiveness 
for something you did. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm just trying to process. Yes. Can you receive? Can, can you? Can you? Can allow, you be forgiven? Right. Can will you, you allow yourself to be forgiven? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know that goes back to the thing of, of yeah. being the giver. Well, that's why yes. I. Um, you said so much that I want to touch on, but with the Course in Miracles. Uh, and you, there's another part that you said that I want to bring up, but this one part about can you forgive yourself? Mm-hmm. Can you receive forgiveness? Yes. That's one of the things that I love about A Course in Miracles because for me that's about um, if I can forgive myself, then I can forgive you. Exactly. Because all it's, forgiveness it's, is self-forgiveness. Right. Right. Yes. So there's two things I want to mention. One mm-hmm. was that I was listening to and watching Chris Cuomo and Deepak Chopra on, I was watching it on YouTube and Deepak brought up things that you just mentioned. And he was mentioning the last moments of Jesus. And he mentioned how it represents man or humanity. Yes. And he said, um, the point where the person came and wanted to take the cross. And when he thought he was being forsaken or abandoned by God and uh, forgive them for they know not what they do. Yes. So when the man came, he in Deepak's words, uh, Jesus said, no, I'll carry my own cross. And he said, that is man must bear his own cross. Mm hmm. He must bear his own cross. And then he experiences a dark night of the soul. That was Jesus taking 100% responsibility in that I manifested this moment. Mm -hmm, I'll mm -hmm. carry my own cross. And the dark night of the soul for man is when he thought he was being abandoned. Yes. And, you know, it's just him, you know, in his. Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Right. And when he was talking about forgive them for they know not what they do, he Mm -hmm. was talking about how forgiveness is peace. Yes. And you described that. Yes. You described that when you were describing your experience with mm-hmm. the boyfriend, mm-hmm. 66 year old man, your yes. child. Yes. Uh, so that was, that was something. And, I and just, that's exactly what forgiveness is. It is in, it is peace for you. I look at the human experience as of the bookends. There is love and forgiveness Everything else is the story in the middle. I often pose the question, what is love for? And if you break it up, what is love for? Love is forgiving. Yes. So what are you giving? And so God, and and, and this right, isn't from a religious I was, when dynamic. You said what, I, I hear you. And yes. when you said, what is it for? I'm thinking extension. That's the extension. You know, love extends. Mm-hmm. And then you said love is for. Giving. giving. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so forgiveness creates the expense. So earlier when I was talking about capacity, right? What's our capacity? What forgiveness does is increases our capacity for love. Yeah. Because we it are does. the container. No right? question. So the being comes in as this container. Forgiveness increases that capacity right. for the container. And because if you ever see anybody who's really shut down and closed and tight because they are holding a lot of anger or resentment and you know they can't let things go and then when they're finally able to it's just like oh you know just yeah yeah it is it expands your capacity that's why we hear that you know forgiveness is for the forgiver not the forgiving because yeah if you're forgiving someone out there they're going along doing their thing and that you know that's not because they're on their own journey. Right. Right. And it is for your own personal freedom, your right. own, own personal peace. And if you look at the bookends, right, what did God do? He gave God so loved the world that what did he do? He gave, mm-hmm. he gave, he gave his best. Right. That's the, you know, when we look at that's at, beautiful at the what deaths. you just said. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that's the yeah. bookend, right? Yeah. Here's our example. He gave his best. Ah, And then what was his son's last words? Forgive them for they know not what they do. And you know why I love that? And I'm so, I'm so mindful that everyone doesn't believe in Jesus. And, you know, I just want this, this is such an open platform for people to believe whatever they believe. And that's why this isn't about religion. This is the, the story. This is the principle of the story. Right. But I want to bring up Jesus. Yes. Because for me, he represented 
taking on whatever you think you did. I'll take it. I'll take it. So if you think you're, Mm -hmm. you're bad or evil or, you know, you just can't get something right, whatever it is, just put it on me. I'll take it. Right. And so you're fine. Mm -hmm. You're fine. And so that is give my very best. God gave his very best best. for somebody to take that off of you. Right. It's off of you now. Right. Exactly. So it's something that comes up for me as we're talking about this. When I was talking about running, running was, um, is a transformative act that links my mind, my body, and my spirit. That's yes. what got me into running, right? It wasn't that one day I said, one day I'm going to run, run a marathon. It was my Forrest Gump moment. I just started running one day. And it was my healing process in terms of my mom's death. But also during that time, the distinction between, for me, relationship and religion, that it wasn't a religious faction. It was my communication relationship with where I was choosing to serve. You know, I don't care if it's Buddha, if I don't care if it's, you know, the universe, whatever that is, what allows capacity, right? Right. What, what's allowing me to expand my capacity? And I went on mm. a, on a journey. Mm-hmm to have a relationship with God in God's word. So every day I was reading the Bible and there are certain scriptures, if you will, that became a part of my living dynamic, my expression, the the learning tool, gotten them from the Course in Miracles. It wasn't to limit it. It was my surrender to God. God, let's talk. Mm-hmm. I need to have a conversation. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to look in here for your feedback, right? Mm-hmm. Of what connects me, what expands me. And so there are what I call my verses of life practice. So I'm not, mm-hmm. I don't get into debating the story mm-hmm. and all of that, mm-hmm. but what were the verses of, of life practice? And it goes back to earlier in terms of the foundation of Matt Miracles. It was founded on the commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all right. thy heart and all they might, and, and love thy neighbor as, as thyself. Mm-hmm. Ah, setting the standard. The other one is bringing us around to so that love and forgiveness, right? I said those two things. These are the bookends. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And then forgiveness. Not just Father, forgive them, but it is give. Nothing comes before that word. Nothing. Yes. It says give and it yes. shall be given to yes. given unto you, shaken together, pressed yes. down and without measure. It doesn't say go get, go make, go find. And if we really lived from that, to me, that is what the love to you in the mirror pledge is. It, because when you eat living give, from a place of giving, listen, giving does exactly what you said. I keep looking at this bottle because now I'm like, you're, you're measuring. This bottle. You're in- I'm equating the bottle with capacity. Yeah. But giving expands our capacity. If you want this coaster right here and I'm like, I don't want to give that to you because that's my only coaster. Well, then I'm limiting myself. I'm limiting myself. Cause you're not making space for a new coaster. I'm not making space. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's what giving does is it allows us to make space. Right, right, right. So I don't want to be open about what happened to me, but there's something that I want to bring up something that's frequently on my mind about you and a gift. And it speaks to what you brought up about your experience. Cause that's the first time I heard you mention, you know, oh, in God, terms of the it, molestation. It, it, no, it, well, what? that's not the first time, oh. but the experience that you had with God. Mm. And yes. so I remember asking you thinking about an experience that I had and talking to you about an experience that I had. And I remember asking you, what did you do where you didn't carry this thing with you throughout your life? Because that definitely impacted my Mm self-worth. And you said something like, to the effect of, it just didn't. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I think the bottom line was it didn't define you. Right. I think that was the bottom line. Right. 
but I didn't understand what you were saying at the time. Like I mm-hmm. understood your point, you know, maybe five years later or something like that. I was just like, huh, did she answer my question? You know, and then, but you did answer but my that's question. That's what I mean by, you did. by choosing our responses. Yes. You know, did, did I... Did I want my babysitter's boyfriend to come in? No. Did I want my stepfather to to molest me? No. But how I responded to it. That's why when I say, you know, who I am is the woman that I've chosen to be in all of the experiences that I've manifested in my life. I take 100% responsibility for manifesting those because I have a mission. Mm -hmm. I have a calling. Uh, It puts me in the mind of uh, Wayne Dyer, when he wrote his book, Inspiration is Calling. I I was so relating to that. And he was talking about his conversation with God, if you will, and why he was called to the planet, right? He was called for the inspiring and healing of others. And in this conversation, it's like God said, oh, okay, well, let's give you an alcoholic father, Right, Lyle, exactly. So you can learn to forgive. It, and then right. we're going to get, right? Right, like, we're going to have you be in, you, or, in an orphanage. and yeah, Right. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I say that there are no wasted experiences. No, there are only experiences that we may choose to waste. But every experience that comes to us comes for us. I believe that 100%. To the depth of my soul. I don't care how bad it may be. I don't care what it is that my soul has called forth that experience for its expansion. And if we can get with that, if we can really honor the truth of that, kind of going to the conversation we were having a little earlier and talking with your nephew and when he was saying like his belief of, hey, this is just stuff that's happening His right. high, and connecting with higher self that that's that knowingness of that little child. That's that six year old child that God spoke through. Yeah. Said, so, baby, you have no idea how this moment right here is increasing your capacity to love and to forgive and to serve mm-hmm. you throughout the world and to serve others. Yeah. You know, if I can, there's another experience. The contrast yeah. of my learning. Interesting dynamic. I'm, so I'm the only child between my mother and father. And both my mother and father were previously married and had two children. My mother had two boys and my father had a son and a daughter. And when my mom and dad came together, had me, I was that odd child. And they were much older. My brother's 10 and 12 years older. And... I used to always say to my mom that, you know, I felt like the mutt. And she said, you're not the mutt. You're the conduit. You're the glue. And I never got that for a while. And and then I got it. I, I got it that I, yeah, I'm the neutral witness that has that ability to be a part of, to be open to, but not attached to. And there was an experience with my sister, my older sister, who passed away. But prior to her passing, you know, I've shared that my father and I were disconnected for a lot of years. So I was raised by my mom. And I didn't see my dad from the time that I was nine, almost 10. Um, But I was nine years old. It was 10 years later. I'm 19 years old. And by the way, at the age of 11, my conversation with God, God It was a moment of surrender that I didn't realize was surrender. But my prayer to God was asking God to give my dad and I the opportunity to come together so that I can just tell him I love him, right? It was allowing this moment. That was my prayer. Pray for my dad. These years go by, no communication. And when I'm 19, my great-grandmother passed. My grandmother called me to tell me that she passed away and asked me if I would come to the funeral. And I only had one question. Will my dad be there? And she said, yes, he is coming. I'll be there. And for me, that was God. Here he is. This is this opportunity, right? And again, I have an older sister who at the time addicted to heroin, angry. Is uh, she his daughter? Yes. Yes. This is my father. Yes. So my father had the son and the daughter. And so... I had connected with her going back and forth visiting my grandmother. Hadn't seen her in a while. 
But then I see her at the funeral. One night, and this was the night that we buried my great grandmother that later that evening, my dad, my sister, myself, the three of us are sitting around my cousin's table. And it was my dad opening himself up, his vulnerable moment is like, okay, whatever y'all want to say, say what you got to say, like get it out right. kind of thing. And my sister was filled with anger. She blamed my father for everything that went wrong. She blamed my father for becoming a drug addict, and he, even though he wasn't there. But, you know, yes. everything that went wrong in her life was because he my dad there. left. Right. You weren't there. And in the midst of my sister spewing her feel, you know, expressing her feelings, she started hyperventilating. She fell out on the floor. And now my dad's freaking out. And I was like, give me a paper bag. You know, I'm the calm one. Get a paper bag and I have her breathing into the bag. And my dad calls 911 and they come and, you know, and they're like, well, she did a good job. She got her to come around and they get her settled. Sister goes to bed. Now it's just my dad and I left and we're sitting at the table. And first he was, how did you know what to do and how did you respond? And I was like, well, I, my mom is hyperventilated. And so I learned. And then he looked over at me kind of gritted his teeth like, okay, now she's going to let me have it. And he said, all right, get it out. It's your turn. What do you want to say to me? I said, just two things. He said, what is it? <laughs> I said, I love you and thank you. And he said, what? I said, I love you and thank you. And these tears just welled in my dad's eyes. And he said, what do you mean? I mean, I love you. And I thank you for planting the seed that brought me forth. Because without you, I wouldn't be here. And I'm grateful for being here and I'm grateful for my life. So thank you for your contribution to that. And that was my other God moment. And it wasn't a comparison, but it was an observation. It was God saying with my sister, this is what unforgiveness will do to you. This is what it looks like. And when I asked God to bring, and when I said that prayer, I said, bring my dad and I together so that I can tell my dad I love him before you take one of us from this earth. That was August of 1979. My dad left this earth in July of 1980. Really? Yes. And I always reflect on that, that had I not had that space of forgiveness, I would not have had that gift. And I wouldn't have the gift of my two baby sisters after he remarried. And, and so, again, it was that opportunity to expand the capacity of love through forgiveness. Not what all went wrong, you know. Right. What is is what is. Right. It's what we do with yeah. what is. Yeah, and I think that what we don't do is say what the pain is or, you know, the hurt is to mm -hmm. the other person. Right. You know, we're saying what the anger is or we're withholding, but... I think that when we know how to tell someone how we feel, where they're just able to just listen, where they can hear what we're saying, that's impactful mm -hmm. because then they understand. Like if you tell me that you're feeling a certain way as a result of my actions and, you know, I understand that you're really feeling hurt you're really feeling pain. And I understand that it's a result of my actions. I'm really going to respond to that. For me personally, I'm going to move forward. I'm, when I say forward, I mean, I'm moving towards you rather than trying to be defensive because I'm connecting with what you're feeling and I care about how you feel. And you may, but that doesn't mean that everybody will. I agree with you. I mean, in reality, I'm, the only I think reason the I difference, say that, well, I'm just going to say mm -hmm. that I think the difference is because of the way that we communicate. Like we're not communicating in a way where we are letting people know that we're in pain, that we hurt. We're communicating from a place of we're trying to be angry. We're shielding our pain. More often than not, we don't even allow ourselves to feel our true feelings and authentically connect with it. A perfect example, I remember when uh, Rosie O'Donnell had 
her breakdown with Barbara Walters from when she was working on The View. And in her anger, her spewing, right? That's in essence what my sister did. She was spewing out her anger. And after Rosie went through therapy, she she had some sessions after her healing, a part of her healing. What she said, which is what I believe is most profound, is that I expressed anger when I should have just said you hurt my feelings, acknowledging our hurt. That's why when I tell you our mantra, our feelings matter, our thinking makes the difference, we have to become aware of what our feelings are, like honor them. Definitely. So that's why when I talk about forgiveness, I'm not talking about excusing. I'm not saying, oh, well, what you did to me is okay. I forgive you. That's not what forgiveness is. I said to my father exactly what I meant. I love you and I thank you. Now, all that other crap, it is what it is. That's your burden to bear, not mine. Mm -hmm. And what we do when we don't forgive is we take on other people's burdens for the thoughts that we think they should have had and what they should have done. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes, it, it's drinking the poison. Right. It's drinking the poison. That's what we're doing when we don't forgive. We drink the poison. And forgiveness is about really just our ability to release that. And not to have the expectation of somebody's response. I go back to give and it shall be given yeah. unto you. It's not forgiving for acceptance. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Because yeah. when we do that, that is setting an expectation That's, and an yeah. expectation is nothing but a setup for disappointment. I can't conceive of that, how that would work. I mean, or the somebody thinking that would work. I don't get that. It's having an expected response. There is an expectation more often than not of how we want people to respond in relationships. Yes. Well, I, we I apologize about that. Right. Mm -hmm. I apologize to you and you didn't even respond. Do you accept my apology? Well, it doesn't matter whether they accept it or not. Mm -hmm. That's really irrelevant. The apology is for you. Right. Not for them, even though you're apologizing for something you may have committed. It's like what the thing is right. for. You got to go a, back to that. It's an acknowledgement of I regret that I did this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and if we have an expectation that if we apologize for an act and then we're not forgiven for it. Yeah, there's nothing then you can do. There's about that, that judgment of, well, now you're wrong. And that's what I'm that's what I mean by not setting expectations for other right. people's response. Be, yeah. We can only own our own yeah. response. I can't I can't right, I agree. If I apologize to you and you don't and I mean and it's sincere. If, if it's sincere for me and it's not received, I can't do anything about that. I can't. Even if it's not <laughs> sincere, right? Like no, but because I mean, sincerity is the judgment of, okay, oh well I would have accepted if it was sincere, but that's a judgment. Of whether you think it's sincere or not, because that's based upon well, your thoughts. Whether you or not you accepted, that's not the same as whether or not it was sincere. I mean, if I mean it, if I'm opening up my heart and spirit and I'm apologizing to you, if you don't think it's sincere, that's beside the point of whether right. it was sincere or not. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So, well, one question that I would like to ask people, and I feel like you answered it, but maybe you have something different, mm -hmm. is... If you have uh, a superpower, what would you say that it is? Love. 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 Love and forgiveness. I Yes, it, it is the bookend. Mm -hmm. What is love for? Love is forgiving. So love and forgiving is my superpower. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, you have something else that... I don't know what you call it, but I remember, and I've brought this up to you before, being at one of your brunches, and you asked the question, we were like in little groups, and you asked the question if we had anything that we regret in life, and my thing was, I can't remember what other people's were, but I remember mine was that I never had kids, and you said, well, maybe there's you brought up nurturing and then you said, well, maybe there's something else. Maybe For you to birth. Right. Right. And I think that is such a gift that you have. And so that was what you said to me. And then you said something to somebody else and, you know, we, you know, we went around. Mm -hmm. And so speak to that, you know, that part of 
wisdom that you have, because I think that's really wise because that was really valuable to me Mm -hmm. because it's like um, it gave me it expanded my capacity yes. <laughs> awesome. for uh, for what I already appreciated about myself. Yes. But it took it deeper. You know, it was like, yeah, I can give birth to this and this. But that was coming from, to me, an insight that you have, a wisdom that you have. I'm just giving one example. But as I said, you do this with other people and that day and in your work? Well, you know, earlier when we were talking, you asked me about my, my gift. And part of that is, you know, as is expressed as being called to inspire. You know, when I was a kid, I was often asked if I thought about going into therapy. I was the lunchtime therapist. <laughs> but again, I have to just refer to the idea of how am I called to serve and who am I called to serve? And my job is what? What did I say my job is? My job is to love as much as possible every day. Mm-hmm. To do those things that I love and to lay aside those things that I don't. And when I do, my coffer will expand more for love. So that's the job. That's the job. So how do I do that job? How do I serve that job? And, and then it's honoring like what's the gift that's given? Because I get that and I appreciate that from a a standpoint of wisdom and goes back to my mom. When I was two years old, I remember witnessing standing uh, running into the kitchen, hearing my mom crying. And we were staying with uh, my aunt at the time. And my mom had a butcher knife to her chest and just saying, I can't take it anymore. At the beginning of my book, I say my mother threw me a life preserver, even when she was drowning because my mother could spew out the most inspiring words Laying beneath the stars, oh, my darling, reach for the moon, so should you fall, you'll land amongst the stars. So this comes from somewhere, it comes from your mom. But here's the thing, (laughs) then in the next vein, I'm watching her stick a butcher knife to her chest saying, I can't stand life anymore, take me out of here, right? I witnessed my mother, and I knew it was a call for help, but I witnessed her attempts, attempts to take jabs at her own life. She never did anything that she never put a bullet to her head. Right. Mm -hmm. But she would have these acts. Basically it was an expression of her pain. Not that she didn't want to live, even though that was what she would express. And being a witness to that as early as two years old and being the only one in the household And living with my mom after her nervous breakdown and nurturing my mother. I was my mother's caretaker. And this very same woman who would inspire others. My my mother was doing motivational speaking before it was called that. My mother had this class, the three Ps, and she would inspire young people to pursue their goals. So I witnessed both sides of that. And early on in life, for me, it was, what are you choosing? What are you choosing? It's always a choice. What are you choosing? Where are you choosing to put your attention? I watched my mother study depression. Well, the more you study it, the more you learn how to do it. Right? Like the books that she, the things, that, the books she chose to read. Not, and, and you know, you laugh, but I, I'm telling you, Adrian, it, it, when I look back, it was like, wow, this was really such an insightful lesson. And I, I believe that what my gift is, is not so much that I know how to, in essence, tell you what your thing is, as much as the discernment of energy. I believe that that is that is what I have been gifted. That's why I'm very selective about words. Well, wait a minute. Why did you use that word? Right. Mm -hmm. Because that word has energy in it. And. I recognize when I'm doing it to myself, my neutral witness is, okay, well, you've chosen an interesting set of circumstances. Let's look at how you're feeling around all of this. Look at the conversation you're having, right? And when I talked about being that child, I was the observer of the family more than I was the participant. So I've had this ability to be on the observation deck while being inside. 
of the fringe and the fray. Right. Oh. Right. And so that's and that's I, really what I believe that you're responding to is how I'm able to observe externally what I see inside. Because the only way right. that I can offer anything is like, mm -hmm, when did you look like that? When did you make that assessment? How did you judge yourself that way? When I say all judgment Meaning is self-judgment. you're self -judgment. talking about yourself. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. All judgment is self-judgment. All forgiveness is self-forgiveness. So before I, st you know. Rather, before I point the finger at you, let's look at those fingers pointing back at me and say, oh, I, you, Nadir Mawakil, my hubby, I love his quote when he says, hmm, is that being on your own side? How am I being right, on my own side? Right, right, right. And love that. Yeah. So I think really the, my gift and the ability to, I say, coach rather than counsel mm -hmm. is the ability to tell the truth to myself about myself. Yeah. That's what helps me to be able to support others in, in their coaching. Yeah. So real quick, I have to say, because, you know, I went to Dr. Marks this morning. Right. And the exercise that like what we did is such an expression of what we're talking about yeah. here. And and you've had acting classes. We've talked about that. In acting classes, you do mirroring exercises. Right. And this is not, he's not an acting class. No. Well, you'll say this after a, you yes, tell the yes. story. But I wanted to make is. the analogy right. of like in acting classes, if you've ever done like yeah, mirroring yeah. exercises, mm -hmm. right? This was a mirroring energy exercise. So we're sitting in the Ooh. chair. Right? Ooh. And the person, <laughs> so... Let's say you're standing behind me. So there's a, a person that was standing behind me. I'm in the chair and, and wow. Dr. Mark is guiding. He said, okay, you want to follow the pace of the person sitting in the chair. And it was movements that we were doing. And it was like rotating our, our head. So as we were moving and you're aware that there is a person that's behind you, that person is mimicking you, but they're your guide. Now, I want you to think about that because in life and in the flow of the dance, and that's what we even said, that this felt like a dance, in the flow of the dance, because what this person is doing is they're mirroring you and then they tap in and, and massage your shoulders. They tap into you to move energy. They've got to be able to connect with where you are to receive your energy and move as you move. And he would coach people along and say, make sure you're following the person you're guiding. Mm -hmm. Now, if you understand that from a coaching perspective, a shepherding, how does a shepherd lead? When we talk about leaders, leading isn't about follow me. Leading mm -hmm. is from behind the shepherding. Let me see where you're going. Let me provide a little bumper pad. To me, that's really what parenting is about, is being able to shepherd, right? From behind. In speaking to what we're speaking to, that was so profound for me, having that experience and exchanging that energy, because our exchange, I believe in the human dynamic and relationship is that we are always shepherding and following. And that is what so makes true. me an effective coach. The way I'm able to shepherd is what's this pledge? I'm going to let you read this one right out loud because this is what we're practicing this week, which is this one right here. And we listening to understand. Listening to understand. When you said how I responded to you, it wasn't what my thoughts are. I was listening to understand where you were mm -hmm. and then widen the lens. And I believe that that's what I have the gift to do is to help you expand your own lens. It goes back to capacity. Yeah. Because for the most part, when we observe our own life, when we observe life, we do it with a narrow lens. We are zoomed in what we we're talking about earlier, the space, right? But this is what it looks like. Oh, but widen the lens. Look at all of this that right. is out here to prepare you for that. We were talking about my photography and the poetry and the alignment of that. To me, that's a part of my energy healing, right? And what I do with the camera is what I, I seek to do with an individual from a coaching perspective is help you widen your own lens. Yeah. And that has me thinking about even prayer to allow, like if there's something, and I want to mention something another guest has said, but it's like if I'm thinking about something that I desire to take place, I want to leave room for God to do what he would have me do, 
because very likely that's much greater than I can conceive. And I was talking about this with another guest and she was talking about how she doesn't like to be specific most of the time because she feels that even what I just said could be too specific. She just likes to God, you know, you know, and let it be that, let it be that and let God just do what he's going to do. And then it's just like, wow. Yeah. I like to surmise it by saying, stay committed to the vision, not stuck in the picture. Yes. And that's the thing is, you know, when we set a goal, goal setting, it can be one of our biggest pitfalls as well as an asset. So long as you're committed to the vision, not stuck in the picture. If you set the goal, you know, we've talked about this in terms of job. I want this job. I have a goal to get this job right here. And you do all of the preparing and you do all of the research and you know, oh my gosh, I'm ready. But what God has for you, no individual can take from you. That's but what right. happens when we get stuck in the picture and we go for that job and we don't get that job. Or we get it and that's not But I want to look at, the, at it, it like, let's say that you don't, right? And when you don't get it, then that inward egoic chat is feeling like a failure when we don't accomplish right. a goal that we set out for, right? And then if you do get the job and it doesn't satisfy, that's because you were stuck in the picture and you missed the vision. We have to get clear on what our intentions are. What's the feeling? Yeah. Not like, what do I want the man or the woman to look like? What kind of job do I want them to have? Right. You know, what kind of job do I want? What kind of house do I want to live? Yeah, you can paint pictures in your head. That's part of my challenge with vision boards mm. is getting stuck in the picture. I do vision boarding, but I'm more into creating mind maps mm -hmm. than vision board. And when I was in design school, it really was like mind mapping. They were called bubble diagrams. Before you put a hard line on a blueprint, what's the vision of the spatial relation? You don't start hard lining. And that's what mind mapping is? Yeah, mind mapping is just, huh, you know, here I am in the center and I want music. In my life, let me put music. Music is is a very integral part yeah. of what inspires me. Oh, you know what? Nature, and you start putting these things around you to see how they connect. I love that. Yes, that's mind mapping as opposed to. By the time I'm this age, I want to drive this car and I want to have <laughs> this house, and and we get stuck in that. And guess what? You know there are those mm -hmm. that you know. Oh, check. Oh, check that off the list. I got all of these things. But at the end of the day, yeah. Who are you with the acquirement and how do you feel about who you are being and right. becoming in that process? Yeah. Because if the goal is just to have money, use money as an example and say money's the goal. I want a million dollars. That's my goal. And if that's the only requirement is to have a million dollars, well, what will you do for that million? Yeah. Well, it's yeah. so funny because when I think about money, I think that it can be so limiting it's really about what the money is for. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. One of the most difficult questions for people to answer, and it goes back to when we were talking at the very beginning of this about self-awareness. Self-awareness is knowing what we want. Mm -hmm. What do I want? And the number of people who aren't able to answer that, what they want is the outcome of it's the tangible. I want money. I want a house. I want a car. That's the stuff. Yeah. Right. And you know this, that within bad miracles, there's what I call the transformula. It's the foundation from which I teach and coach mm -hmm. from. And the transformula is that clear intention plus focused attention equals divine retention. Right. And we've all gone through life. And this is the, that session you were talking about when I was asking about regret right the question what I said has have you ever said I didn't intend to I was teaching the transformula uh -huh. how many people in here have said I didn't intend to right and you fill in the blank right and you were like well I didn't intend not to have children right 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 and so we go through life and we look at I wanted this or I wanted that and that didn't happen and it's not due to your lack of intention but it's the attention 
What attention right. did you put exactly. on that? Exactly, exactly. Because truth is, if you wanted to be a mother, you could that's be a mother, it, whether you adopted. And right, I've what, said that to myself. Yes. So you're totally right. Yes. You're so totally it's right. like, where am I directing my attention? Right. And the more clear that we really get, it's not the manifestation of the thing, but what do I want my life to feel like? Mm-hmm. I use my daughter as an example, you know, works for Google. I remember us having this conversation before, before she ever interviewed It was the conversation of, how do you want to feel when you go to work? What's the environment? What kind of people you want to work with? Right. Describe, describe the feeling. And if we can practice describing what we want to feel, the intention rises up from that feeling. And you know what? That's obviously, you know, that's Abraham Hicks talks about this all the time, but I love the way that you're describing that, you know, because she is all about having the feeling, you know, the feeling comes first, but the way that you just described it is brings it home Mm -hmm. to me. That brings it home in a really, really, really big way. That's why I say I'd rather mind map than vision board. Yeah. Because I've seen people do a vision board and make their lives miserable trying to find that wedding dress, that car. And oh my gosh, you just completely missed the designer who could be your new best yeah. friend or what whatever that is that's a part of the the vision I want to go back to energy for a second and I might edit this out at <laughs> this part I'm about to ask you <laughs> you know I, well I'm, well you get to choose because you know I'm all about the energy well no because this Everything is like is something personal for me okay I was like well I'm gonna ask you offline and I was like well let me ask you online bring and it then, on girl and then if there. I have to edit it out I will but I'm so curious about Energy. Energy is huge for me. And that's why earlier today I was talking about, you know, that feeling inside of me of uh, connection and love and God and everything I was feeling, mm-hmm. you know, being with the girlfriends and all of that. So I have this experience where I have this meeting every Friday. OK, and there have been times and I've mentioned this actually in the past where after the meeting, I have one time I felt a migraine coming on and I went outside and I walked to the bank and I just, you know, to just kind of clear my head. And what I've come up with is I just don't want to do this. And, you know, changes are going to be made, but it was like, I just don't want to do this. And there's been times, you know, just the, the dynamic, the energy dynamic with me and this person Mm -hmm. um, where it's like, and I don't like for people to get to me. But there's something where it's like I feel this energy for the rest of the day or days where something would be bothering me. And that's not like me to not like let something go. Okay. So anyway, everything is improving. There's going to be some changes made. And yesterday on the meeting and before the meeting, I'm doing a lot of things. I'm pretty productive before the meeting, right? And, you know, and I've had my spiritual practice and I'm connected with God. And like I said, I'm pretty productive in different ways. Good mindset is the point I'm trying to get to. Mm -hmm. The meeting is fine. Nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. Not that there's been anything wrong in the other meetings. It's just that in the other meetings, it's like, I don't even want to be doing this, you know? Mm -hmm. But now that day, everything was fine. But still, afterwards... I feel like there's just like this blanket on me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what is that? It's like now I have to I have to do the things that I need to do to shift myself into a better place. And I'm just I just want to know what insights might come to you from that. And maybe that'll spark something in me. I'm sure I'll figure it out as time goes by. But it has me very curious because I'm pretty in tuned with me. Mm -hmm. So it has me very curious. So I'm going to refer to uh, an energy program that I do, which is how to shift your shit. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. It's your stories, your habits, your influences, and your thoughts. That's why I keep going back and forth talking about, you know, the thoughts that we're thinking. And energetically, first of all, in order to to create a shift, it requires a pattern interruption. Yes. And I've done that. Okay. Effectively. So... Before but you're this, talking before about this going this into meeting. a thing. Okay. But here's my question to you is, what do what are you doing to, one, 
prepare yourself for external energies. You know, often True. with, with mm-hmm. you know, even as a practitioner, before I have a coaching session with anyone, before I engage with anyone, I protect my own energy. Yes. I do my own clearing. And this is virtual, by the way. Okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Before I get on a Zoom, it doesn't matter if it's virtual, if it's live, because the energy is there. You know, gotcha. that's like when we're on the phone with somebody. We might be on the phone with somebody in Africa, but energetically, we're right there together. Right. In terms of the energy. So from an energetic standpoint, I have an energy mantra that I use in, in our team, and we use this at Dr. Marks, and that is, my energy is mine, and everything else is its. I will not take on anyone else's energy, nor will I put my energy upon anyone else. Whatever I am called to do, the divine will show me. And it's using that mantra before you go in. And it is, I release all psychic debris, all negativities, all judgments. Because again, you could sum it up by saying, I release all thought. One of my favorite quotes, and you've heard me use this in my workshop by Nietzsche, is that oftentimes people operate as if they're thinking when they are actually being thought. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Is that the same as... Our thoughts are not our real thoughts. Is that the same thing which yes. you just said? In essence, yes. Okay. We act like we're thinking the thought when we are actually reacting. That's why 90%, 98% mm-hmm. of our thoughts are not our own original thoughts. Right. We are either regurgitating, right. reprocessing exactly. other thoughts, and what we take on from the outside. So you go in energetically. You already have that energetic seed in the ground of what my expectation is. Exactly. And energetically, it's manifested. Wow. The reason I say wow is because that's speaking to my power that I'm not using to my benefit. That's it. Deep. Are you being on your own side? Deep. Yes. And the transferring of that, the shifting of that is, let me shift and create a different story. It starts with shifting the story. And though a story comes from this thought, it's, so I go back to taking the aerial view. Okay, you know what? I've created this story here. And you shift the story. You know what I also think, in addition to what you just said, I think that, how do I put this? I have an awareness of how the energy that I can project. And so. And we're always projecting energy. Right. So if I'm doing that to myself and because sometimes it's like, let's say if you and me had a problem and I feel some kind of energy and I'm walking around the rest of the day and I'm just like, you know, feeling some kind of way about you and all of this. I think even though you're the way that you are, I think that if there's some conflict between me and you, you're feeling some energy as well. And Mm -hmm. so what I'm saying is, is that I personally don't want to project negative energy onto anybody. I don't have a desire to do that unless I'm really in my ego, in my human self, which I can be. Sometimes I want to get you, but in general, I don't have a desire to project negative energy in the sense of people remember how you make them feel, feel. you know, even though I'm responsible for the way I feel you Mm and we understand the point. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm just getting to is when I said, look at my power, look at what I'm doing to myself, but it's also about what I project, you know? And so I don't have, a des- I don't have a desire to project, to leave somebody with some negative energy on them. Mm-hmm. I don't have a desire to do that. And so that's to me about accountability or mm-hmm. responsibility. Taking authorship for the story you're creating. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, Neville, you know, we talk about all of the various uh, leaders of thought and uh, Neville Goddard comes to mind and the power of awareness. Delicious. And in the power of awareness, he's talking about exactly what you're describing and uses a situation of a woman unhappy on her job, an assistant who really wants to have a conversation with her boss And she's avoiding the conversation and the same thing just keeps playing out over and over. But she is always having a conversation in her head. (laughs) 
Uh-huh. And that's where we have all of our con- Heck our yeah, conversations that's so true. always take first in in our head. Yes. And so and the power of awareness say, is changing the conversation. That's how you change the energy, right? Change like you, the conversation. Yeah, like you said, you didn't want to project negative energy, but you do that with your thoughts. If you're thinking, I really don't like this person. I don't want to be around this person. This person makes me feel yucky. That's the energy that you're projecting mm-hmm. from those thoughts. Mm-hmm. And it's not, as our dear Kev likes to say, it is not putting icing on shit and calling it cake. It's not trying to make yourself believe something about that person that you don't believe. It's not, oh, wow, you know what? They really are a fantastic person Mm -hmm. and I love who they are. And that's not true. So now you're lying to yourself. You know what I'm thinking also, though? I'm I'm realizing that in general, a prayer that really works for me is the this prayer from A Course in Miracles that I know you know. I desire this moment for a holy instant. Mm -hmm. That's the first line of it. The prayer is, I desire this moment for a holy instant, then I may share it with my brother whom I love. I cannot have it without them or them without me. It's entirely possible for us to share it now. And then it goes on to another couple lines. Mm -hmm. Well, I always insert the person's name. That prayer is probably the most powerful prayer for me. It absolutely works. I do use that prayer on this person. You know, I'll say this person's name. And then there's one by uh, Marianne Williamson praying to remove the walls between us and help us to see our innocence and our love. Mm -hmm. And I don't do that on Fridays. Mm -hmm. I don't do that on that day. Yeah, that's what's it's it's you changing your practice pattern interruption. Because it it definitely works. It definitely works on these other occasions, you know, that I do it. I don't do it on that day. Mm Mm-hmm. There's something powerful about this cloak that I feel, mm-hmm. you know, but it, it is what you just said. So it's changing the story. It's yeah. changing the conversation that you're having internally mm-hmm. to impact the experience that you're having externally. Yeah. And they might not do anything different. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times they don't. Yeah. But it's, oh, it's your view of the lens when you adjust mm-hmm. the lens. That's what I say. It's not feeding yourself some bull by saying, you know, oh, I really like them and they're fun to be around. That's not true. <laughs> the truth is this person challenges me. That cloak that I feel is there for me to see something. Wow. What? Okay. What can I see that I can learn and grow from? Yeah, I've been trying How to figure that exist? out. Well, but you know, it, beyond it, it's, what I already it's discovered. posing yeah. the, the kinds of questions yeah. that allow you to expand and grow. What's something that is, that's positive about, not necessarily positive, but what is something about this person that helps me see me better, right? This judgment that I have, ooh, how can I see my judgments more clearly? It's directing it inward because that's what expands the capacity. Right. And then evoking that prayer of, you know, the compassion exercise. Just like me, this person is doing the best they can with what they have. Right. Just like me, this person is seeking some happiness too. Mm-hmm. Just like me, this person gets lost and confused. Right. Like it's yeah. a just like yeah. me thing that allows compassion rather than judgment. Right, right, In right. essence, yes. Well, before we close, Dr. Mark, share about Dr. Mark, just, you know, where he is and, you know, oh. just in general what he does. Yes, yes, Dr. Yeah. Mark, the uh, Hemke Center for Wholeness uh, in Alpharetta. And he is, uh, he's my guy. If you're in the Atlanta area, he uh, has a practice. Again, it's a uh, holistic healing Mm -hmm. and And he's been a guest on here early on absolutely (laughs) absolutely yes i i remember that and he does and and what we've been talking about i just highly recommend is his saturday morning qigong it's every saturday morning 8 a.m like 8 to 9 30 and uh the exchange of energy the expansion and it's different every time and yes and yes it really is about following the energy yeah yeah yes beautiful experience and how can people reach you well i say check out our website madmiracles.com if you have questions you want to find out about workshops uh, you can reach us there follow us on social media at mad miracles fan page and that's uh, on facebook as well as instagram and uh 
those are the two. And then on LinkedIn, uh, we're Mad Miracles. Wow. Yes. Have I uh, just worn you out? I mean, I had to take advantage of Honey, this opportunity. I, let me tell you, you didn't wear me out. You <laughs> charged me up. And I do want to invite people to come and uh, just engage in the dialogue of the love, the you, and the mirror. And uh, that's that, that's on Zoom. It's on Wednesday evenings. We're going into the fourth week. It's a six week process, but then we're going to be starting back up and and extending it. And uh, oh, okay, yes, cool. yes. So it's it's an it's an evolution. It's a six weeks, and and you can jump in whenever you jump in. And I always say whenever you jump in, it's perfect. But when you are SVP for the space, you get a book of the it's the Mad Transformation Guidebook. It's a free conversation. The Mad Book is free. All you need do is to show up with. Uh, what I say is an open heart, an empty mind, and a full glass of yumminess of whatever that is, <laughs> whether it's your tea, your coffee, your wine, whatever. Let's sip and chat. Awesome. Yes. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. <laughs> this, you know, this is always a joy and a pleasure. I love hanging with you and uh, transforming the world through our healing conversations. That is exactly what we're doing. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. What a conversation, right? Well, thank you for joining us. Remember, you can listen to Let's Start Healing on traditional platforms. Please subscribe to the podcast. Share the podcast with at least one person that you know. Until next time, let's start healing.